is lying. Unforgivable. And he knew that. He was prepared to destroy his own humanity in order to save the species. He made an incredible sacrifice. No. Yeah, hell yeah! Hell yeah! That is Howard Zinn that Matthew McConaughey and Matt Damon were talking about. Um, one of the world's greatest historians, scholars. At times he's even accused of being a non-plagiarist. And today we're talking to someone who's standing athwart the progress of a nation, who's trying to undo all the good that's been done by the work of this man. Her name is Mary Graybar. Mary's a PhD. Uh, she's an accomplished scholar and historian, and she's got a book called Debunking Howard Zinn. Mary, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing pretty well, but I'm really uh, disturbed. I, when I'm reading your book, I think back to all the people who told me what a great man Howard Zinn was and how this book would change my life. And here you are standing athwart history trying to say, no, it's not true. The bridge is out. How dare you, ma'am? How dare you? What, what brought you to this decision to spend your time writing about this? I taught, I taught college for 20 years and uh, noticed the corruption and the decay in it and noticed that students didn't understand what communism was or they thought of it as simply a red scare and started writing about education and noticed Howard Zinn around 2008. And I've been monitoring monitoring him ever since, writing reports and articles. And then I started the research for this book in earnest about two years ago. And um, it was worse than I thought. Um, you know, I knew he was a leftist. I knew he hated America, but he commits all the sins of uh, people who claim to be historians should not commit. So I think there are two types of people who are going to hear this interview. There's the first type that are people I know that I talk to all the time. are going to say, oh, yeah, I remember Howard Zinn. What's the big deal? I don't really read him. I don't care. Uh, but I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. And there's the other types that I went on Instagram last night and it was on hashtag Howard Zinn. And I'll show some screenshots to the audience of people who said things like this book changed my life. This is the true history they don't teach you in school. I changed my major as soon as my college professor recommended this to me. And I think those are the ones that we need to kind of focus on in terms of the effect this man has had and playing back from the, uh, the, tea, the green to the T in terms of what his motivations were, what type of character he had, what are the things we don't know about him that we need to, and how he's been able to survive things that other authors had not. You talk in the book about people like Irving and Stephen Ambrose who uh, took a lot of shame and a lot of grief for some of the mistakes they made and Howard Zinn didn't do that. He could just come out with another uh, a revised issue and all sins were immediately forgiven. So uh, before we kind of dive into those topics, how did uh, you've, you've got so many things you could write. How did you decide on this? I know you said that you've uh, the things you did earlier, but how did you decide this is the book you want to write? Well, he, um, Howard Zinn was a communist. Um, he was a member of the Communist Party. And I think he had the most influence. Now he was older than the new left. He was sort of a mentor to the new left uh, of the 1960s. So he was born in 1922 and he went from being a member of the communist party, just you know, dropping his official membership, but nonetheless spreading the poison of communism among uh, the radicals and other professors. So. Uh, in terms of a ripple effect, I think Howard Zinn is where it pretty much begins in, uh, when we talk about how education and, and the study of history has deteriorated. Is it fair to throw out that word communist? I mean, you know, there was the Red Scare. You have a, let me see what the, the chapter heading is here. Chapter six, writing the Red Menace out of history. Are you going to be accused of being a... Um, a fascist, conspiracy theorist, McCarthyist for saying, hey, Howard Zinn was a communist, and now we can just dismiss his important impact on American history. What do you have to back that up, <laughs> Ms. Grabar? <laughs> yeah, uh, no doubt I will, but um, Howard Zinn had an FBI file that was over 500 pages long, and of course, throughout his book, he uh, attacks the FBI and says they were persecuting civil rights leaders like the Black Panthers, you know, who were essentially terrorists. Um, I'm not the only one who has come out and uh, said that Howard Zinn was a communist. Ron Radosh, who was uh, briefly a communist himself, uh, you know, categorically claimed, yes, that uh, 
he uh, was a, uh, you know, was a communist by looking at his file. Uh, he could tell he's a scholar. Uh, he wrote the book on uh, the Rosenbergs. So I'm not the only one who is uh, saying that. So, uh, you know, Howard Zinn, you know, on the one hand would uh, promote communism, but then say, I'm not a communist. He would praise it and say, but I'm not a communist. So there's a contradiction there too. In terms of the way that you, you know what, I want to go back a little bit. Before, I've got a, a couple of things I definitely want to get into before we get back to communism. So I've got some excerpts here. In terms of talking about the reach and influence of the book, uh, Zinn has a couple of quotes I saw over social media. One is about how, and I might butcher the quote because I don't have it in front of me. It's such a radical, there's nothing more radical revolutionary than telling the truth. And as I read through the book, chapter after chapter, I think, this is a topic he's not well versed on. It's a nice quote, but how would he know that? And then another one talks about how small changes uh, can change the world. And this idea of that anybody can change the world. This is something Jordan Peterson attacks a lot. He says, look, don't anyone who talks about changing the world, if they can't make their bed in the morning, they're not equipped to do much of anything, which is why they focus on big problems and not small ones to abscond that fact. And I think, you know, you look at all the small lies that you pointed out, and I want to get into the plagiarism where basically he had people that were fellow travelers and ideological partners who he plagiarized, who knew about it, who said nothing. Like today you would get you run out of, well, I hope it would get you run out of town on a rail. But the fact that these things have survived and been hidden, uh, it really is a page turner for those of you who want to go check out the book and learn it for yourself. But in our cultural zeitgeist today, you've got, uh, here's a quote. This country was founded on white supremacy. That's Beta or Robert Francis Beta O'Rourke at a campaign event this year. Uh, we are living in a visible fascism ascendant. I say visible because those paying attention watch it survive and thrive under the protection of the state for decades, which is ripped directly from Howard Zinn's People, the History of the United States. That was an armed attacker who tried to bomb the ICE detention center in July. Uh, Pete Buttigieg. I think that's how you say it, said white America needs to face the roots of inequities and the fact of systemic racism, racism all around us. It's in the air we breathe. Your thesis is that a lot of this comes from the teachings that were incorporated in the 80s and 90s of Howard Zinn. Make your case, please. Well, absolutely. We've had uh, two generations of parents educated on Howard Zinn, uh, reading the book, A People's History of the United States. Uh, being taught by teachers who read the book in colleges of education, sometimes the only history book they read. Uh, they're downloading lessons. Um, they're seeing it in movies uh, like Goodwill Hunting. It, rock bands pay tribute to him. Uh, I think he was on The Daily Show, uh, Howard Zinn, when he was alive. He's a very cool guy. I mean, he's hip. He was a celebrity. He's a rock star of a historian. And uh, when it comes to truth, what uh, Howard Zinn uses these very um, devious rhetorical strategies. He says, you know, that really he speaks directly to the reader. He says, all these other people who were telling you these things about American history, they were lying. And I am going to tell you the truth. I am going to reveal the conspiracy of silence um, about American history, that it was a good country that, you know, promoted democracy and the rule of law. It's all wrong, he says. And um, so he kind of sweeps the reader up into this uh, sort of mode of conspiracy, uh, you know, and appeals really mostly uh, to adolescents who are in that you know, phase of their development where they don't trust authority. So he uses that. He's very, very skillful in that way. Let's kind of break into some of the topics where you kind of knock down some of those straw men. You talk about the power of rhetoric and asking open questions than answering yourself as opposed to doing scholarly, scholarly um, research and facts. You talk about how People's History of the United States is one of the most prominent history books in America yet it has very few footnotes. And also there was a stat that it sells more copies year after year. I think it's up to about 2.5 uh, 2 million copies. And a big part of that is because it gets downloaded so often by teachers. And I saw this on social media too. You'd see people talking about how much they love the book and then you'd see someone say, yeah, it's my favorite. It's the only one I recommend to my students. And I went, oh man, that, <laughs> that's a future AOC classroom. Um, 
But in terms of some of the specifics that I think will interest the readers the most, let's turn to the chapters and talk about things they're going to learn. The first chapter is Columbus Bad, Indians Good. And I was excited because I, I don't know if it's Samuel Elliott Morrison or Samuel Elliotson, I forget his name, but he was a Harvard professor who's considered one of the prominent scholars on Columbus. And he had a book called Admiral of the Ocean, Admiral of the Sea, which I read several chapters of last year when I was doing a Columbus Day video, which I will link to. Uh, just talking about how there's things about Columbus that really are pretty fascinating in terms of what he believed his mission was and what he had experienced in terms of uh, this whole journey. And you basically say that Zinn butchers this and turns the narrative upside down. Can you elaborate a little bit on what people learn that perhaps they shouldn't and what they don't learn that they should? Well, uh, for, well his opening pages of uh, Columbus and his men uh, landing and being greeted by the gentle Arawaks, um, which is what he calls the Indians, it's not the accurate name, uh, who bring him gifts and food. And in return, Columbus and his men uh, enslave them, work them to death for gold, hack off their hands. Um, you know, that is completely false. Um, I looked at some of his sources. He doesn't use footnotes, but he does have a bibliography. And I noticed a book by Hans Koning. Now, Hans Koning was a comrade of Zinn's in the anti-Vietnam War movement. He was not a historian. He was a novelist and a screenwriter. He was a socialist. So he wrote this little screed uh, for high school students without any footnotes or research about Columbus. Uh, that was published in 1976. Well, Howard Zinn in his opening pages plagiarizes from that. Uh, I would have failed any college freshman uh, for doing what Howard Zinn does. All he does is he just sort of rearranges a few words, substitutes a few words, but essentially it's all Hans Koning. Uh, Hans Koning also quotes uh, Columbus's journals. Uh, Zinn uh, also quotes from parts of Columbus's journals, but he quotes very selectively. He says, um, he, he uh, attributes what someone is, what he's saying about another tribe that sees them as being good servants and wants to attack them. He claims that Columbus is saying that about himself that Columbus is saying they would make good servants, uh, we can make them do what we want. Uh, and then there are ellipses. Um, and ellipses, you know, the four dots usually indicate the end of a sentence or a sentence, maybe two. Well, he eliminates two days worth of journal entries. And within those two days worth, you understand that, that he believes that we can convert them by love. Zinn leaves out the fact that he wants to save their souls with love. So he gives the exact opposite impression of what Columbus's goals were. And let's talk more about, I think this will be really fascinating to people who maybe are not uh, that learned about what Columbus actually wrote about what was happening at the time and the different histories that are there. And what's the gentleman's name who was the first priest that was a slave owner who actually converted and tried to... Uh, yeah. What, what's the gentleman's name? De Las Casas? De La... I can't remember. Yes, De Las Casas, Bartholome Las Casas. You make a very <laughs> strong argument that there are all these historical writings we have access to. And Zen basically takes pieces here and here and here and puts them together to make it look like these men had evil intentions. And there were some really bad things that happened, but that there was were planned aforetime and that it was because they had no interest in... Uh, being friendly with the Indians or converting them or uh, coexisting with them, but because they were white, privileged racists who wanted to hunt, pillage, and do barbaric things. And uh, and you basically say that because of Zinn strategically leaving out certain timelines or certain acts of good, or one example I think was that Columbus uh, had told his men to do X, and then he left, and a couple of them said, well, screw that, we don't care what Columbus says, and they went out and did some horrible things, and Columbus gets blamed for it, and uh, Zinn basically accuses that of being Columbus's plan the whole time. And that type of mentality and mindset uh, is basically steeped throughout the chapter. To give Morris, uh, Morrison, uh, well, he also, uh, you know, he admitted that Columbus would, you know, did not have control of his men all the time. And so you had, yeah, you know, abuses, you know, were committed. 
but that was not Columbus's goal. And Columbus, um, you know, was named after Christopher Columbus, uh, the saint of travelers. He was an explorer. Um, so yeah, bad things did happen, but that was not uh, Christopher Columbus's intention. Uh, his intention was to discover new worlds and as a devout Christian to spread Christianity, a, a noble goal. One of the things I definitely want to bring up, because I hadn't read it previously, I did an interview with Ramon Ibrahim about all the big battles between Christianity and Islam. And I'd uh, link that in the description so people can check it out, because it's it's fascinating to think about what these Christians have been going through for a thousand years ago in this basically uh, struggle for survival. You assert, and I don't know if it's because of Morrison, but you say one of the reasons, uh, you know, he gets criticized for getting lost, for calling them Indians, for not knowing where he's going. But you talk about how there had been a, uh, a desire and a search for a long time to find new Eastern trading routes to Europe. And it was because of the fact that Muslims had invaded and marauded the land and basically been kicked out of most of their old cities. So Columbus had multiple incentives and reasons for doing what he did. And one of them was because he was looking for allies. And so one of his primary motivations was to find people that could help them take their lands back. And they found the Indians and he sought to make friends with them. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, he was he was doing what the Europeans were doing, um, you know, trying to find a, a, a new route um, to go uh, to reclaim the lands and, uh, you know, so in 1492, you know, uh, Spain had been taken back from the Muslims and uh, had suffered under Muslim rule. And so he was just trying to find a new route and, um, you know, instead of going around the Horn of Africa. And, uh, you know, that that was his goal. Can we talk about plagiarism a little bit? You do some side-by-side -side readings, and it's fascinating to hear how much of what he wrote was lifted directly from people who either didn't get credit or didn't say anything about it, didn't complain, didn't uh, register their unhappiness or pursue him for this. And you talk about all the revised editions of the book, how they get mentioned or things get changed, but he hasn't really paid a price like you would assume someone would today for doing the same thing. And you mentioned Ambrose and Irving and other people who didn't get away with similar things and had their reputation stained as a result. Um, yeah, one of the most famous cases is Doris Kearns Goodwin, who is recently having a revival. She was kicked off the Pulitzer board off the PBS show. Um, but yeah, I mean, Zinn's friend, Hans Koning, who I mentioned, uh, who'd written that book for high school students uh, about Columbus, never appears to have said anything. Uh, Zinn also plagiarized from Gary Nash. Um, you know, I provide page by page quotations. Of course, I didn't have room for all of them. Um, so sure. he's, he plagiarizes from Gary Nash, um, you know, on his book on uh, Indians and African Americans. Uh, there was a uh, professor by the name of Countryman uh, who had written to him and complained that, uh, you know, he used his essay in a collection and didn't give him credit. Uh, you know, and he said, well, I know I don't want to be uncomradely. <laughs> so he was on his side. Right. So so Zinn in the next edition, you know, just really didn't fully acknowledge uh, the debt he owed to this uh, professor named Countryman. Uh, but, you know, in parentheses, you know, said, see uh, his essays in, in such and such a, a book. And uh so yeah, those are those are three examples of you know the plagiarism that Zinn committed while he's claiming to uncover new materials. Oh yeah, and that was a big theme is that this is all new history he's uncovered that uh, no one's ever really talked about before, and people kind of just let that slide. And uh, so in chapter two, which I have not read yet, it's called The Life of Zinn. What do we need to know about this man that's going to maybe change our... Uh, I read Intellectuals by Paul Johnson last year. And it's this fascinating debate I had with someone who's much highly educated, much higher, more highly educated than I am about whether or not it matters what these people did in their private lives, what type of character they had, and if you can separate I their ideas and theories from the, th the things they put in practice in their lives. Kind of that whole Bill Clinton look. 
president can do what he wants. He's off the clock, doesn't matter, which of course doesn't apply so much to Trump because he's a horrible person and we have to judge him for the decisions he makes. I've never quite figured that one out, but for Howard Zinn, if we're gonna apply that conversation, what is important to know about him as we're reading his pages, what his motivations were, his incentives and his worldview? Well, I think the most important thing is that he was a communist. Um, and in his autobiography, he talks about how uh, as a teenager already, he was seeing that the American system could not be reformed, that we had to start over again. So his whole career was dedicated to indoctrinating students about that and writing essays and books for that goal. He, his goal is to have a revolution, tear the whole system down. And if you read through his book, you see, you know, there are no solutions, nothing's working in the United States. All, you know, uh, the civil rights movement didn't work, uh, the women's rights movement didn't work. We just need to tear it down. So that's his goal. Um, and his books are written, uh, you know, and the main book is written, uh, you know, as propaganda for that. Uh, the other thing about Howard Zinn, um, you know, he was a member of the Communist Party. Uh, he claimed to be leading students at Spelman College where he taught uh, on behalf of civil rights. That was not his goal. His goal was uh, to sow discord um, and, and basically a civil war, provoke violence, uh, you know, during the Vietnam War protests, he was on the side of North Vietnam, even went to North Vietnam uh, as a publicity stunt with Father Berrigan to bring back three American prisoners of war. Uh, he was also, he would not have, I don't know if he would have survived the Me Too movement. Uh, he was fired. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is all public record. He's got two admiring biographers and uh, they write about this. Uh, but when he was fired from Spelman College uh, by the first uh, black and the first male president of the college, by the way, for insubordination, Zinn fought that and, um, and basically called uh, Albert Manley, the president, uh, as being like a plantation owner on on his college campus. Racism. You know, Racism. Yeah. But then Albert Manley threatened to reveal a morals charge against Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn was quite popular with the young ladies at Spelman College. And he had been caught parked in a car uh, with a young student far from her destination on a dead end street at about 10 o'clock at night. Um, <laughs> he would have been a good Uber driver. I hear stories like that all the time. He, uh, Mrs. He, Calling. Yeah, yeah he, he was a notorious womanizer and his biographers admit that. He, he, he admitted to having affairs. He thought of leaving his wife. He, he was, you know, told his daughter when she was 25 that he was in love with another woman. Uh, you know, of course, she was quite hurt by that. But then, um, <coughs> excuse me, he uh, he decided to stay with with Roz, um, but continued to have flings through the rest of his life. And I've heard stories about his personal behavior around young women, um, which is pretty bad. We've mentioned communism a lot, and this gets played down. I have a really good um, interview with Paul Kengor, where he talks about mm -hmm. this goal that the communists had to start a race war. And I'm no expert on this, but you touch on it in chapter seven, which you call black mascots for a red revolution. Oh, and before I get into this, uh, I was thinking as you were talking that one of the things I didn't hear much about Zinn and until I read your book was all the criticism that was hurled at him from left wing and leftist uh, intellectuals. Uh, you've got Eugene Genovese, if I'm saying it right, who said he was a Marxist and it's really just incoherent left-wing sloganizing and he refused to review the book. You've got Michael Kamen, who said the book was single-minded, sim simple-minded history. Kaizen said it was polemic disguised as history. And Schlesinger, now Arthur Schlesinger Jr. said that he's not actually a historian. 
So I wasn't aware that there were all these people who came out and said, this guy really doesn't deserve any of the accolades we're throwing at him. How did he overcome that? How has he gotten to a point now where I think the stat is that 84,000 teachers a year in America go and download his material from the Zen teaching site to teach to their children, to their students? Well, yeah, I mean, it's an indication of the decay of education and uh, knowledge of history. So as time goes on, uh, you know, uh, the, these critics, you know, some of them die out, <laughs> uh, they retire, <laughs> and you have no alternative voices. Uh, uh, conservatives are kept out of academia, so you don't have any uh, challenge to him. And, uh, and so, you know, Zinn's view becomes the dominant one. Uh, and of course, the, his left wing um, allies had good reason to um, be angry at him uh, because Zinn basically says that all the things that the progressives tried to do, whether it was child labor laws or food safety laws or civil rights, um, you know, I may have a question about that, but anything that the left wing did, it had no effect. The, the situation is hopeless. So he doesn't give credit to, you know, to the leftists, and that's why they um, they were angry with him. Yeah, you're right. I remember reading that some of the progressives said you basically dismissed all the progress we've made so far. A similar conversation we hear today about discarding all of Barack Obama's accomplishments so that we can move further to the left in our democratic debates. Um, so let's get back to the communism thing. Black mascots for Red Revolution. You had quotes in here from actually Lenin when he took his platform uh, referred to the quote unquote Negro Negro problem, which is something you say in the book. You would think students say reading this book would have an issue with how many times he referred to uh, black Americans as Negroes. But um, mm -hmm. he also sought to blame the plight. Tell me if this sounds familiar, people at home. He sought to blame the plight of Negroes and African Americans and their station in life on capitalism and its failures. Uh, this is from Lenin's original points on communism. And so tell me what uh, Zinn and Lenin had in common, what they were trying to accomplish, what they what were you to talk about in terms of black mascots for Red Revolution? What does that mean? Well, um, you know, the, the communists used uh, African-Americans in order to start a civil war. That's what they wanted. Um, right from the beginning that um, blacks were sent out into the streets uh, and uh, hopes of starting a riot, they, you know, get their heads knocked in by the police. And then, of course, uh, there would be outrage about that and protests. Uh, so that's been going on since uh, 1919. Um, Howard Zinn wants to continue that. So uh, the protests in the 1960s, if they were peaceful, he doesn't like it. Um, you know, the, uh, the, reforms that were made uh, matter not at all. He glorifies riots. He thinks they're just great. <laughs> he glorifies what uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee did. Um, he wants, you know, people die. He's happy about it. I mean, he presents it as, you know, uh, you know, this martyrdom for a wonderful cause. And he completely misrepresents African Americans who were rightfully suspicious of the communists, who, for the the overwhelming majority of them, hated the communists and knew that they were there just to exploit them. But Howard Zinn says that the communists were the only people who showed any concern for African Americans, uh, about lynching, about segregation, and so forth. I mean, that's patently false. They were there to exploit them. And I also point out the case of Lovett Fort Whiteman, just one of them who died in the gulag after being lured over to the Soviet Union. Yeah, I learned about him originally from Ken Gore, that he was lured over there uh, to be a uh, important person kind of like a ringleader in the movement and he had a change of heart when he was in Russia and they said okay you're not of any use anymore so here's the gulag isn't that about what happened yeah he wanted to come back um and uh what what actually happened was um 
he didn't get the memo that uh, you know that that the strategy was uh, changing to a common front in 1935. That you know that that the uh, that the uh, tactics were not um, uh, about uh, attacking uh, you know America as fascists, but we had to collaborate and. Uh, so he criticized uh, a collection of short stories by Langston Hughes that had just come out. Uh, and um, and so was put under suspicion. He was accused of being a Trotskyite. His fellow black uh, communists there who were there for uh, a meeting uh, actually uh, collaborated with the Soviet Union uh, that sent him into exile and then put him on uh, you know, in Siberia, where he was um, beaten and starved to death. So basically, he learned the hard way that Black Lives Matter sometimes. Yeah. Well, when they're doing yeah. what's needed. Yeah, uh, there were others, too. Yeah, it's sad. Trading cotton for votes. Um, so... I just want to give people an over. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of different choices they have when they read books. This is a real page turner. You're going to learn a lot of. Th I mean, truly, you'll learn things that you didn't learn in school about the things that supposedly you didn't learn in school that Howard Zinn said. Um, what other? What is there anything you learned reading or researching or writing the book that you didn't know before? What's someone really going to come away with that will surprise them when they read your book? I knew that Howard Zinn was bad. <laughs> uh, you know, that he was exact. I thought he was exaggerating. Uh, you know, I knew he had communist sympathies. I thought he was just putting a spin on history. Um, but it's much more than that. I mean, uh, you know, I was sitting here, uh, I think, on a cold January night and reading, um, you know, the plagiarized passages of you know, from the Koning's book on, um, on Columbus. And I was like, you know, it's like one of those moments. And I, it's like, you can't believe it. You shake your head and you think, like, as you pointed out, how could people for 40 years now have been fooled by this guy? Um, I went to another book uh, that he uh, put in his bibliography by Douglas Pike. And I started reading it. Now, Zinn presents Douglas Pike's uh, book. He was a, an American Foreign S Service officer in Vietnam, and he wrote a book on, Viet on the Viet Cong. Zinn, and he was there from like 1960 to 65. Now, Zinn says, uh, quoting from Douglas Pike, that the Viet Cong were teaching the villagers in South Vietnam, Vietnam communication strategies. But if you look at Douglas Pike's book, he does use the phrase communication strategies, but it's in terms of agitprop. Uh, Douglas Pike does not say that the Viet Cong were friends or were the, were the uh, allies of the freedom-loving South Vietnamese. He accused them of genocide. He, and he pleaded with the Americans to come and help uh, the Vietnamese and their fight against these communists who are terrorizing them and using Maoist um, strategies on them to provoke, uh, you know, conflict among themselves and murdering people. Uh, there's that. Uh, there is. There are just so many things that have been left out, distorted, are factually uh, untrue, made up. Um, it, it's just a fraudulent piece of history. It's, you know, uh, it's not just that he hated America. He just lied throughout his book uh, on every single page. You talk a lot about, uh, and in some of the, the prep material, the cultural zeitgeist, which I mentioned earlier, the way that you get a generation full of snowflake millennials and uh, AOCs is that you teach their teachers that American history is a lie and you give them the inside track on what's really going on. And there's a focus on racism and sexism and classism and how horrible of a country and horrible white European people, the plague that they are on the earth. And basically that this is the inevitable outcome of those teachings. So what do we do? 
Well, I'm hoping my book will open some eyes and I hope people will be as um, shocked as I was. Um, I don't think we've had the tools to attack Howard Zinn, uh, you know, rightfully. A lot of people have, uh, you know, railed against him, uh, attacked him in articles, um, but no one has uncovered uh, the uh, historical uh, strategies that he's used, the propagandistic techniques. So for students who may be bothered by what their professors are saying about American history and recommending Zinn's book as they are, as I've heard uh, from a student recently, uh, I have the book, I go through it, I have the footnotes, and if anyone wants to dispute what I'm saying, well, let's discuss it on the research I've done uh, from historians that are both on the right and the left, uh, from Howard Zinn's papers at New York University, from the Library of Congress, from the Martin Luther King Jr. Center. So um, I, I, I want to take the discussion over to the facts and to the fraudulence of Howard Zinn's history. And I, when you were talking, it reminded me that I read in the book that it, the people's history sp spans supposedly 1492 to present. But what's the percentage of it that is focused on everything from basically what the last 50 years of his lifetime, which is the 30s onward? I can't recall the stat. Um, I, I can't recall it right uh, now either. But um, yeah, there's an inordinate uh, amount of material on the 1960s, <laughs> which, uh, you know, of course, is, you know, was the goal of Howard Zinn where he saw, you know, protests all over the country, students, you know, rising up, riots. That was his glory period. He did not like, um, you know, the 1980s at all. <laughs> I mean, he wrote it in the late 1970s, but he thought that in the 1960s, we almost got there. We almost had a communist revolution, um, but sadly for him, we didn't. Ironically, I think Paul Johnson was the one who referred to the 1960s as America's suicide attempt. So now this is our re communist, yeah. This is our rehab period. Mary Gabar is a PhD. She, ca uh, she taught college for 20 years. You can find her writings at the Federalist Town Hall, Front Page, City Journal, American Greatness, and Academic Questions. The book is debunking Howard Zinn, exposing the what exposing the fake history that turned a generation against America. If you're looking for a good read and a very enthralling uh, page turner, I highly suggest you go out and read it, especially if you have friends in the teaching profession or children of teachable or what, grade school, high school, college age. Uh, Mary, the book released on August 20th, right? So everyone can go out and get it right now. Uh, yes, any place books are sold. <laughs> well, I have really, really enjoyed it. I feel like the least I can do is help you sell more copies and get the message out there. And hopefully, Howard Zinn will have his Bill Clinton moment in the next 10 or 20 years where he goes, everyone looks at him and says, this guy, uh, this guy's kind of gross. <laughs> like, why why did we let him do the things? He, he's gross. Um, Mary, thank you so much. Any final words? Um, well, I... Uh, like I said, I I, um, I welcome debate, and I hope uh, you know students pick this up. They need the ammunition, and I appreciate uh, your support and uh, letting me uh, expand on what's in the book. There's so much more in it, and um, I I hope it will be very helpful to students and to our country and to general readers who are also uh, have been taken in by Howard's and and want to fight his lies. Go grab it on Amazon or Audible. Check it out. Give it as a gift. Um, I <laughs> There's 2.8 million copies of People's History of the United States, and there should be far fewer. But do your part to make sure that people actually know what uh, this man was about. Thank you so much, Mary. Good luck. Thank you.